Our next panel will be Pathway Toward Adoption Practitioner Viewpoints, and I will turn it over to the moderator, Adam Green. Thank you, Evan. Uh, some of this will probably have some overlap with the first panel and perhaps the next panel, so we'll try to avoid as much overlap as possible. Uh, my name is Adam Crane. I'm a partner with the offshore litigation specialist firm Baker and Partners in our Cayman Islands office. I'm delighted to be here today to moderate this group of esteemed panelists. I just first want to thank the IIII, uh, United Nations, and the Bankruptcy Court for hosting this conference and to Evan Zucker for inviting me to moderate. Uh, I'll start with just quick introductions so we can move on and, and keep some good time. I'll start with uh, immediately to my left, we have Min Han, who is an attorney from Kim and Chang in Seoul, Korea. Uh, to Min's left, we have Mr. Howard Morris, who is a partner and the head of the Business Restructuring and Insolvency Group in the London office of Morris, Morrison Forrester. And to Howard's left, we have Smitha Menon, who is the head of the restructuring and insolvency practice and is a partner with Wong Partnership in Singapore. And to her left, we have Diana Rivera Andrade, who is a founding partner of Rivera Andrade, a boutique firm which specializes in insolvency law in Colombia. And to Diana's left, we have Mr. Robert Van Galen, who is an advisor with Nata Dutil. I hope I got that right, Robert in Amsterdam, and he's the head of the firm's insolvency and restructuring group. And last but not least, we have uh, Ms. Deborah Grassgreen, who is a partner in the San Francisco office of Pachalski, Stang, Zeal, and Jones, where she heads the firm's international insolvency practice. So we will kick off with uh, a brief discussion uh, with the panelists looking at the approach to the adoption of the model law on cross-border insolvency and what mechanisms are in place to recognize and enforce judgments in their home jurisdictions. So Min, how about uh, we start you off. Uh, can you tell us the process undertaken by Korea and uh, tell us what the system was in place in Korea? Uh, or what it is for the recognition and enforcement of insolvency-related judgments. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I feel very honored to participate in this conference and share my views on the adoption of the model law on insolvency-related judgment. Let me introduce briefly uh, the uh, current regime in Korea uh, for recognition and enforcement of foreign insolvency-related judgment. Uh, next sli slide, please. In 2006, Korea adopted the Model Law on Cross-Border Insolvency, MLCBI, which was incorporated in Chapter 5 of our insolvency law. Upon the adoption of MLCBI, Korea transitioned from territorial principle to modified universalism. The, as you know, the MLCBI allows for the recognition enforcement of a foreign insolvency proceeding subject to recognition and relief granted by a domestic court, which is equivalent to, in essence, the recognition and enforcement of judgment commencing a foreign insolvency proceeding. Uh, Korea has separate uh, traditional rules for rec recognizing and enforcing uh, foreign judgment under the Civil Procedures Code and Civil Enforcement Code, respectively, uh, which I will call uh, traditional rules. Uh, for your information, Korea does not, uh, did not adopt the Hague, Hague Convention on Judgment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, under the traditional rules, uh, foreign judgment can be recognized and enforced if they satisfy essentially the following requirements. The valid jurisdiction and of the originating court and legitimate service process and no violation of public policy and reciprocity or its equivalent. Uh, what is important here, uh, uh, which I will discuss later, in particular, uh, service process must comply with the law of the originating state. And if it is made in Korea, it must also comply with Korean law, uh, including uh, any applicable treaty. Korea is a party to Hague Convention on Service Process. And the abolishment of territorial principle in 2006 opened up the possibility of recognizing and enforcing foreign insolvency-related judgment under the traditional rules. This was confirmed by the Supreme Court decision of 2010, which I will cover later. Uh, thank you. 
Thank you, Min. Uh, Smith, uh, I understand that Singapore has adopted the model law on cross-border insolvency and uh, uses Article 21 to recognize and enforce foreign insolvency-related judgments. Can you tell us about this? Uh, very briefly, we followed the U.S. approach in this front. When we um, adopted, when we enacted the model law, our Article 21 1G, we took out the qualifier. So Article 21 1G just it's got the chapeau at the start that says the court may, upon recognition, grant any appropriate relief. So that's one ground, just relying on just the chapeau to grant recognition and enforcement. The other ground is at subparagraph G, where it says um, the court can grant any additional relief that may be available to a uh, Singapore insolvency holder, and we've removed the words um, under the laws of Singapore. So, and under our case law, it's been sort of established that this means the court is not restricted from granting relief that may be available under foreign law as well. And we've gone on to rely on that to recognize a few decisions. Thank you, Samantha. Howard, uh, we heard a bit about the UK consultation with a disclaimer of watch this space. Uh, why has the UK uh, relatively been so quick to announce uh, its intention to adopt the model laws? And does this mean that the UK is in favor of a more universalist approach? <clears throat> Well, we've lost a great deal. We lost European insolvency regulation. So, so far as the, the, pre, the profession uh, is concerned, and the, I mean the wider legal profession, the financial advisors, uh, the institutions, uh, the funds, who, specialist investors in distress who are all present in London, um, there has been a great deal of regret, not only that the European insolvency regulation was lost as a consequence of Brexit, um, but there was no negotiation or discussion, as far as we're aware, about replacing it with anything. A pretty impractical idea, um, but nonetheless, we've been, we've been thrown back into the period where we're just banging rocks together to get recognition <laughs> on the continent of Europe. And I remember, I'm old enough to remember what it was like rocking up at a, a, a provincial French court and trying to, provide, to persuade the judge, who was a cousin of the local liquidator, uh, that uh, an insolvency office holder from the United Kingdom should be recognized. I don't think it's gonna be as difficult as some have feared, but we're there. And so the UK has said by um, consulting early and thinking very seriously, and a lot of work's been done by the insolvency service and by the government's lawyers on this topic, as one would imagine. It's a very serious and well-considered consultation that's gone out and involves a huge amount of work to then report. That is a, a statement that uh, English law, the United Kingdom, wants to remain very much present in international restructuring and insolvency. Are we more universalists now, is that? No, I don't think we are. I think we've become modified universalists, which some translate as meaning we're in favor of universalism so long as English law is paramount. <laughs> Thank you, Howard. Uh, Diana, over to you. How is this process unfolding in Colombia? Hi. I thank for uh, thank you for the invitation and my my in my answer I want to talk about four issues. The first one, Colombia is a constitu uh, continental system, so the difference between you and <laughs> and our system is that the most of you are a common law system, but even that the enacted law of the cross border model insolvency. Um, get very well with our system because the work of the group five was very well done. So uh, even that, even, even we are of continental system, we enacted the law, the model law in 2006 in our last law. Before this law, we have to go to ex Ecuador, uh, rogatory letters, the principle of reciprocity, the international courtesy, and some rules of code, uh, Bustamante Code of 1928, that was the first code about international private law. 
uh, and the Treaty of Montevideo 1979. So uh, our actual law for uh, corporation and business uh, insolvency includes the 2006 Demol Law, and surprisingly, we have uh, since uh, 2011, uh, 11, so, sorry, I have this in German, 2011, that uh, the model law for enterprises group. I know that the enterprises group is only said uh, a few years ago, but uh, we took a draft from the five group and enacted through a decree. But we need uh, to take not only this law that we celebrated, it's also necessary to uh, enact the recommendations about micro and small businesses and the debt to do the duties for directors in the twilight zone. So um, that is that is the experience, and also uh, like the professor told about the member act. To uh, Professor Talk, we need to uh, re enact the, this new law and also uh, in the better way the, the group enterprises model law also. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Deborah, we heard a bit earlier about the U.S. approach from Judge Gropper. Can you uh, please elaborate a bit more on the process in the U.S.? I'll elaborate, I'll recap, and well, I might not disagree completely with Judge Glenn because he's still sitting on the bench. Even though Judge Gropper's sitting right next to him, I'm going to disagree slightly with the very short answer he gave to, is it enough to include it in, uh, in the model law on cross-border insolvency? Yes, the United States has always, um, under general principles of comedy, going back to a Supreme Court decision in the late 1800s, which is old for us, um, has recognized judgments, insolvency-related judgments and other judgments. And we believe that it can be done in the context of our Chapter 15. But where I struggle as a practitioner, um, and this is where my qualified answer to um, I would qualify the answer that Judge Gropper gave about whether it's enough to incorporate it into the model law and cross-border insolvency is that Chapter 15, and as it's been adopted elsewhere around the world, is still a collective proceeding with a lot of bells and whistles to it and a lot of people involved in it. And some of the insolvency-related judgments, we know the definition of insolvency-related judgment in Article 2 um, in the definition section is very broad. It covers a lot of different kinds of judgments, but some of them are as simple as a judgment in Rubin. I just need to go collect a debt um, that arose out of an insolvency proceeding. And in the U.S., you can do that without even going to, through Chapter 15, but depending on where the assets are, you may have to go from state to state to state. You may have to go down to a county level um, in order to collect a debt. But if there was a way to streamline the process, to have um, it, the judgments law incorporated into our Chapter 15 without having to open a full proceeding and have all of the participation by all the participants, which adds a lot of layers, when there's just an isolated issue, I think that's something that should be considered. So I don't know that just putting in Article X is enough. Um, I think the U.S. does it, and we have lots of tools, but from a practitioner's perspective, that's pretty burdensome. And folks in other places in the world might not understand it, but just getting the judgment recognized by the court, that's just the first step. In order to enforce it, there's a lot of other steps that have to be taken, and they have to be taken in a lot of local jurisdictions. Again, in the U.S., we've got 50 states, you know, three territories, and the District of Columbia we've got to deal with. So while well, we have assets that are dispersed, um, it would be really nice to figure out how to expedite the entire procedure um, and to not have to have it necessarily be part of an entire um, Chapter 15 proceeding. So if there was a way not to have to go through all of the bells and whistles and if you're dealing with an isolated judgment. So that's my qualified answer to the earlier question of is it enough to just incorporate it into the uh, existing Chapter 15. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, Robert, I have a tripartite question for you. Uh, why did a country with an international outlook such as the ne Netherlands choose not to adopt the model law on cross-border insolvency? And why do you think there has not been more widespread adoption across the continental European countries? And then the third part, what mechanisms are used by the Netherlands to uh, recognize and enforce foreign insolvency judgments? Uh, thank you. Th th those are quite a few questions. Um, 
let me start with the European Union as it is, as it is of course much more important than the Netherlands. Um, one, one reason I think is that at the time of the adoption of the model law, um, the Europeans were very much uh, looking at their own naval and working on an insolvency regulation, which took a lot of time. Um, so, Ancetral was a more or less a far away thing. Um, they spent their time on this. But there is also um, another issue that I think the way we perceived the model law when we saw it, I was, I was not involved in the, at the time of the adoption. It was very much seen as a, a common law instrument which would be difficult to deal with. I, and I think there are two reasons for that. First of all, well, let me, let me interrupt myself and, and first say that I'm um, a great admirer of the Uncertain Model Law on cross-border insolvency, so I don't want to try to criticize it, um, but I'll just try to ex explain something about the viewpoint. If you look, for example, at the relief provisions, they are a kind of assistance being given by the court to a foreign insolvency um, representative, which I think was un that type of judicial work was not well known in the European Union, in the continental systems. Because what the courts in Europe primarily do in the context of insolvency or judgment is a question of recognition or enforcement, that's it. But more generally, if you look at the way the courts deal with the law, there are many, there are many areas where there are no statutes, and then the courts more or less fill in the law, but they still see it as, well, we find or create the, the rules and then we apply them rather than we are going to manage the process. I think that is, was a somewhat alien concept, although I think it's very wise here. And the other thing is that the communication part in the uh, ancestral model law was also very foreign to us, courts calling each other, uh, communicating, and moreover, there was, of course, a language problem. So it was, um, it, it, was it, it was perceived as difficult. Second point I, I, I'm going to make, and I know it's not so nice to say these things in the ancestral uh, community here, but I'm going to do it anyway because there has to be at least some, some sound of discord here or irritation. Um, what I have seen in the years that, that I was involved, um, and especially with respect to the former secretariat, was that it was very much focused on common law jurisdictions. There was a drafting committee at some stage where I I was invited, I don't know why, but I was invited. <laughs> but I was sitting there with 20 people, accountants and lawyers from common law jurisdictions. I was about the only, I think there was one other person who practiced both in Italy and Australia, so she was a bit of mixed, but I was the only one. And it was to me very clear that, or, no, I should say it differently, I, I think that the, at that time the Secretariat considered continental law or continental perceptions as a bis, bit of a pain in the neck. These Europeans, uh, they talked in the uh, sessions, but then they didn't adopt it. And the Europeans thought we are not being listened to. Uh, other texts are adopted anyway. So let's let them just talk away and we are not going to do this. I, I would like to stress that I think that um, under the guidance of Samir, this has really changed very considerably. We have now drafting groups in which um, 
there is a much more balanced uh, presence of uh, countries, uh, representatives of Germany and France that were not involved at the time do, do uh, join. Um, so I think it's very good, not only because, because it also helps with the um, acceptance of the documents that are being created. So now I have only dealt with, um, uh, with Europe. With respect to Netherlands, I will be very brief then. Why did we not adopt? Well, first of all, the European reasons. Then because as a nation we're very opportunistic. Why should we adopt it when other countries under that model law already recognize our bankruptcy? So there's no need to do it. <laughs> um, then another argument is that from the start, uh, from the time when our Bankruptcy Act was adopted in 1896, uh, some time ago, um, more than a century, at that time, the, the legislator decided not to put any provisions on recognition of bankruptcies uh, in that act and leave that to case law. Again, that would be case law finding the rules, not case law, not, not courts managing the process. So um, the idea was, well, we can do it in this way. And then finally, there was a professor who thought that uh, unsustainable model law was not such a good idea because recognition, fine, but then all these relief provisions, you shouldn't do that. You should just follow the rules of the European insolvency regulation which I think is crazy because um, you have to determine what kind of relief you have to do, and, and Article 22 is very important in that respect. Um, then I think your last point was the... Um, yeah, why, um, how recognition takes place in the Netherlands. Yes. Okay, well, we, we did have until fairly recently the so-called territoriality principle, which meant that we did recognize very little. Um, the, court, the Supreme Court held that uh, at least uh, if, if there was, were foreign proceedings and there were assets in the Netherlands, creditors were free to take recourse against them and we are not bothered by the foreign uh, proceedings. But that has changed substantially um, because our Supreme Court rendered two judgments, one in the Gazprom Bank case and one in the Yukos case, accidentally both relating to Russia. Gazprom Bank was actually not a bankruptcy case. But now we have a general system with respect to any foreign judgment which says that Basically, we, rec we recognize them automatically, as we say, provided four criteria have been met. One is there should be jurisdiction according to international standards, so for example, the COMI. Two, there, has, there should have been a fair trial. Three, um, the consequences of the foreign bankruptcy should not be contrary to public policy. And finally, um, recognition should, there, there should not be a conflict with another judgment which is valid in the Netherlands. So this is a very broad approach. The, I think it's a restatement. I should be a little bit careful here because the Supreme Court did not, our Supreme Court did not really state that this rule about creditors taking recourse um, was, well, let, let me say withdrawn. Um, but I think that is the intention. So I hope I have answered all, all your questions uh, sufficiently. Thank you, Thank you. Robert. You, you have done so very expertly and succinctly. Appreciate it. Uh, Smith, uh, moving back to you. In using the model law on cross-border insolvency to recognize foreign insolvency decisions, Singapore appears to have rejected the approach taken in Rubin. What's the rationale for that? So I won't repeat all the academic debate about Rubin because we're practitioners at this table. Um, in a nutshell, 
there's a policy reason and we found a principle basis as well. So from the policy front, I mean Singapore by reading um, or interpreting Article 21 to encompass enforcement of foreign judgments, we've taken a really firm universalist approach. Um, I mean, very simply, we hate inefficiency and our courts take a very dim view of how um, Practitioners can sometimes exploit the arbitrage that arises when you've got multiple proceedings in various jurisdictions. So consistently, we have always um, sort of taken a universalist approach. Even before we enacted the model law, we did recognize foreign insolvency judgments under common law. Um, there's no reported decision, but we've done that already. So, so that was already our policy thinking. But in terms of a, a legal explanation, um, we just relied on the UNCITRAL 2013 guide that made it clear the list of reliefs in Article 21 should be regarded as non-exhaustive and that the court is not restricted in granting any type of relief that's required. Thank you, Smitha. Uh, before we move on, does anyone else have any comments from a practical point of view on Ruben? All right. Uh, we will now move on to talk about everyone's favorite topic, which is the rule in Gibbs. Um, many people are aware of the recent conflicting judgments from the U.S. Bankruptcy Court in Modern Land and from the High Court in Hong Kong in Rare Earth uh, related to the compromise of U.S. governed debt uh, uh, under a scheme sanctioned in offshore foreign jurisdictions and recognized under Chapter 15. Uh, you will also be aware that some of the stated prin principles of the model law on uh, recognition and enforcement of insolvency judgments are to uh, avoid the duplication of insolvency proceedings, to ensure timely and cost-effective recognition and enforcement of insolvency-related judgments, and to protect and maximize the value of insolvency estates. Seems to me that keeping the Gibbs rule is antithetical to the purposes of uh, these, uh, or antithetical to these purposes, and forcing debtors to commence parallel proceedings to compromise foreign governed debt. Howard, uh, you will be carrying the laboring oar for the UK in this debate under the Gibbs rule. Um, if the UK is prepared to reverse Rubin, what is the objection to reversing Gibbs? Thank you. I don't know how many of you here are familiar with the pantomime, which is a bawdy show uh, that's put on uh, in the Christmas season, is very popular with children, always has a subtext of humour which makes it popular with their parents as well, and it tells fairy stories where there is cross-dressing, the principal boy is played by a girl, the principal uh, the, the, the old maid, as they're called, is always played by a man in drag, and there's a pantomime villain. And the pantomime villain will be the Sheriff of Nottingham or the Vizier in the Aladdin story. Um, they, they are out and out bad guys, bad guys in extreme makeup, and everybody in the audience boos them. Every time they come on stage, they're booed and hissed. Good morning, I'm your pantomime villain today. <laughs> Without the makeup, um, every English lawyer knows exactly what uh, the world's attitude will be towards Gibbs. It's going to be a mixture of um, a, a, a disapproval based on the principled impropriety and, let's face it, jealousy because it attracts work to their location. And it's that. It's that, uh, 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 those two concepts which are at the heart of this. Rubin was always thought by most lawyers, in, in, in English practicing lawyers, to be wrong, to be a surprise. Um, and it was also a judicial message uh, saying, we could have, in the same way as your jurisdiction, decided uh, that it could find scope within the existing model law to say that a foreign judgment would be enforceable in, in the UK, that relief would be given, it would have been quite possible for the judges to, to have reached that conclusion. They didn't. I'm not criticising their principles or their interpretation, nor the principle that certain major changes in the law have to be left to Parliament and not to the judges. But Gibbs is another 
considerable step. And many would say that Gibbs is defensible on the principal grounds that throughout my career we have seen a titanic battle here as international trade and commerce has grown, a titanic battle between competing governing laws as to which laws will be chosen by people who have no relationship to a particular jurisdiction. So one finds now that the success of English law as, as, a, as, a, 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 as a law on the international stage, uh, contracts will be entered into by parties with no connection with the United Kingdom. Nonetheless, they will choose English law. So the principled approach is that you wanted English law, you wanted everything that goes with it, and it's not so much the lawyers and the financial advisors in London, you want the judges. You want English law, which you consider flexible, also predictable, and you want the judges and the judicial system. When you scrape beneath the surface of that, it may be a wrong-headed decision, but nonetheless, it's a decision that many people make. And so the reasoning goes that if you choose English law, you want your contracts, the, the adjustment, the variation, the discharge of obligations under those contracts to be decided in, in, in the courts of England. Or you make the choice to submit to a foreign jurisdiction, in which case Gibbs will fall away. And then there's the practical basis, that London has become a major centre for international restructurings and insolvencies, were it to lose Gibbs, there's a fear that work would leach away from the United Kingdom. And I can't deny that isn't uh, a strategic advantage uh, which the profession, the industry, would be loath to lose. And it'll dress itself in those principled clothes to, to justify it, but nonetheless... OK, you can get on with booing me now and hissing. Thank you, Howard. There were no boos. <laughs> Uh, Min, what is the approach taken in Korea on, on the issue of uh, a discharge of debt affected in a foreign jurisdiction? Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, the Korean Supreme Court decision of 2010 uh, dealt with recognition of foreign courts discharge order. Uh, this case was briefly introduced uh, at the first session but I will cover in more detail. Um, the, first of all, uh, let me introduce briefly the background. The, an individual debtor received a discharge order in a U.S. Chapter 11 proceeding in 2005, and the proceeding was closed. But importantly, it was before Korea discarded the territorial principle, uh, which was in 2006. Um, for some reason, uh, the Chapter 11 proceeding was later reopened in 2007, and in February 2008, the debtor obtained a Korean court order recognizing the Chapter 11 proceeding under the Korean version of the MLCBI. In March 2008, a creditor in Korea who did not participate in the Chapter 11 proceeding filed a petition for bankruptcy proceeding in Korea uh, against the debtor. The debtor owned a uh, real estate in Korea, and the debt creditor attempted to uh, enforce its claim against uh, that building. Um, well, finally, uh, that creditor filed a petition for bankruptcy proceeding in Korea, and the lower court, the court of first instance, granted, uh, uh, issued an order commencing the bankruptcy proceeding, and the debtor um, appealed this order up to the Supreme Court, alleging that the creditor's claim was discharged in the U.S. bankruptcy court in, uh, proceeding. Uh, it seems this uh, background uh, very complicated, but the key issue here is uh, the discharge order of the U.S. bankruptcy proceeding was issued while at the time when Korea maintained the territorial principle. So it was simple legally uh, because uh, uh, the insolvency effect of U.S. Chapter 11 proceeding could not extend to Korea uh, for uh, any reason because of the territorial principle. But anyway, the Supreme Court covered, uh, 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 issued some broad uh, uh, opinion. The Supreme Court of Korea declared that a foreign court discharge order could be recognized in Korea under the traditional rules, which I explained at the beginning. However, the court refused recognition of 
the U.S. Bankruptcy Court discharge order on the ground that it was issued during a time when Korea still applied territorial principle and recognizing such order would be contrary to the public policy. This case, uh, uh, the dispute in this case arose, uh, one of the reasons was the lack of grandfathering provision. When Korea adopted MLCBI, uh, the Korean insolvency law did not include a grandfathering provision uh, to say uh, this amendment applies to foreign proceeding, which is initiated after the effective date of this amendment. That kind of uh, usual clause was not included. That is the part of the reason for this dispute. Anyway, uh, the court also ruled that recognition could not be granted through relief under the insolvency law that enacted the MLCBI. It's the same position as taken uh, in Rubin of UK 2012, two years later. Uh, but the reason why the Supreme Court opined on the applicability of MLCBI to recognition of foreign insolvency foreign discharge order because in the background there is no uh, petition by the debtor for relief seeking for recognition of the U.S. discharge order. Actually, they didn't. And the appellate court pointed out they rejected debtor's claim and uh, the appellate court uh, opined that actually the debtor did not file for relief seeking for uh, recognition of U.S. bankruptcy order. And the appellate court of Korea took different position and took the from the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court overturned uh, the, only the reason. The conclusion was same, but reasoning was different. And the Supreme Court pointed out that your reasoning in the appellate court is incorrect. The appellate court of Korea took the same position as the appellate court in UK in Rubin case. But anyway, uh, next, next sl slide, please. Uh, let me briefly uh, uh, draw the uh, conclusion of the current uh, Korean law. The territorial principle is no longer a basis. We already uh, discarded it. The Korean Supreme Court took the same position as the UK Supreme Court in Rubin. However, the Korea does not adopt a legal principle corresponding to Gibbs rule uh, of the UK with respect to recognition of discharge effected in a foreign insolvency proceeding. So in conclusion, foreign insolvency-related judgment, including a discharge order, can be recognized and enforced in Korea pursuant to the traditional rules. However, there are some unclarity remaining uh, in the traditional rules, uh, which may be resolved by the adoption of the MLIJ. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Min. Uh, Diana, can you tell us how the Colombian courts deal with this discharge issue? Yes, thank you, Adam. Uh, as our our colleague from uh, Korea, we don't have any rules, some like the Gibbs rule. But um, if we have, if another point, we don't have a lot of cases about insolvency cross border, because we have a small co uh, economy and our court is not so. A viable or a secure a precedence or decision. So, but uh, I understand that the rule, the Gibbs rule, is in the spectrum of the territorialism. And when uh, in our court, in our insolvency court, the the judge has to decide about a cross-border insolvency case, the approach is different if it's a reorganization or is a liquidation. If it's a reorganization, the judge is uh, uh, for, for recognize, for example, the decisions and the proceedings of a uh, foreign court. But when it's a liquidation procedure, procedure the, the, the court close the borders and say, okay, I have to protect my own, my own creditors and my own case. So uh, we have we had only a case that is similar to this that was in a reorganization proceeding that was filed in Canada. And the, the holding was in Canada, but the commie was in Colombia. I thought that, seriously. And if, even that, the the Colombian court recognized the proceeding in, in, in Canada and 
uh, recognize the plan that uh, was approved in, in Canada. But uh, in this proceeding, in this recognition, the court uh, ordered a security for five, 50 million of dollars for the national creditors. So even that was a, a recovery proceeding, the, the, co the court protect their own creditors, uh, avoiding the decisions in this, in this way, the decision that could be affect the people in Colombia, for example. That, that was the answer. Thank, Thank you, you. Diana. Uh, Smitha, I understand that Singapore believes in the concept of good forum shopping. Uh, has that belief, or how has that belief influenced Singapore's rejection of the Gibbs rule? Um, so yes and yes. I mean, we definitely believe in the concept of good farm shopping. I mean, as a starting point, we hold quite a different view from the EU when it comes to farm shopping. I mean, our mindset is if the enterprise value of a business that's struggling can be maximized because of certain advantages in a particular jurisdiction, you should go to that jurisdiction and save the company or tr work out what's best for the creditors. And um, We've seen so many examples of this, maybe because in Asia in particular, a lot of countries may not have a restructuring regime, they may not have a scheme regime. So we've seen in large ASEAN nations, they've gone for Chapter 11 or they've gone for UK schemes. And, it's, and these have proven to save businesses. And that's why we have this mindset that, look, you know, good farm shopping, there is something to be said for that. And it's more visceral for us as compared to, say, more advanced or mature jurisdictions where, with large domestic markets where you're a bit insular because you're just looking at how things are dealt with internally. Um, as Singapore's a small country, we usually see what happens to our neighbours because all the businesses tend to be kind of around the region and you see what the effect of that is when you can't um, restructure it by choosing a right jurisdiction. So one example is Garuda Airlines. Um, I mean, it was a, it's an Indonesian airline, and uh, they had some notes that I think were governed by English law, and uh, they went to the UK, got a scheme done, and, and that was very successful. Um, Coder, Recoder as well is something that we thought was really important because um, the ability to have a deep pole structure, so they acquired a UK subsidiary to basically then voluntarily assume all the debts so they could then restructure those debts via scheme in the UK and thereby discharge the original debtors. So this ability to have third party discharges, I mean, these are not available in a lot of jurisdictions. So things like that, um, uh, we, we consider it really valuable. And so these are the reasons why we want or we're encouraging good farm shopping. It's because we think it's you know the best, it can promote not just economic survival, for the company, but also a much better outcome for creditors. Um, but for us, I mean, we do obviously want a principled basis. So that's why we say good farm shopping or bona fide farm shopping. Well, I should say good because I understand from the working group session this week that the use of Latin is very strongly opposed to by Americans <laughs> and um, most other jurisdictions. So, so for us, basically, as long as the foreign court has subject matter jurisdiction and there's some sufficient connection, like assets in the jurisdiction or the governing law of the main um, facility agreements or the notes, uh, that, that country's governing law, um, and there's nothing that would speak against the exercise of jurisdiction, you know, there's due process and all of that's been done, then um, the court would encourage good foreign shopping and allow the debts to be discharged, a debts governed by foreign law to be discharged under that process. Um, so the reason why we don't like the Gibbs rule is because it's a threat to good foreign shopping, obviously. Um, but also, we do find the Gibbs rule or the, the principles underlying that decision to be quite questionable. Um, and we also find it to be outdated. I mean, on the first, um, we think that the court was wrong in characterizing it as a contractual issue. Because they were saying that, look, parties had contracted for their debt to be governed by this law. And so um, you, it's party autonomy, and that's what you need to focus on. And we feel that primacy should be given to the fact that it's about um, insolvency, which is a collective proceeding. So that overrides your contractual considerations. And so policy trumps contract, and your 
the creditor's right to claim against the debtor is really what that should be viewed as in insolvency is that creditor's right to participate in the distribution of the debtor's assets. So in that sense, we feel that Gibbs was wrongly decided for that basis. But also, um, even if it was characterized correctly as a contractual issue, it did seem a bit of a stretch to say that parties would not have anticipated or there's no reasonable expectation that they, um, that they would not be subject to insolvency proceedings. I mean, once you contract with a party, you know there's a possibility that party will undergo distress. And so you already know there's a chance your contractual rights to be impacted by a collective proceeding. And so in today's day, I mean, today's world where we borrow, com companies operate globally and we borrow internationally under multiple um, national laws, it's not a stretch to think that it's reasonable to expect um, creditors to at least have an inkling at the time they contract the debt or the time they extend the financing that there could be restructuring in any one of these jurisdictions. So, um, and I think the English court has acknowledged this as well. Uh, in the Bakri case, which is an Indonesian case, uh, like I think I mentioned earlier, there was an English law governed guarantee and um, that was given to the note holders. And the Indonesian court had discharged that obligation via reorganization plan, but the note holders had gone to um, the UK to enforce the guarantee. And uh, they then went to Singapore to get recognition of that decision. And so the English court, I mean, they said, look, it is pretty, I mean, if you are contracting, if, if you are lending to an Indonesian debtor, the chances of an Indonesian insolvency proceeding is pretty likely. And, but because they were constrained by Gibbs, they had no choice. And uh, so that was the problem. But in Singapore, we had no difficulties, like um, not wanting to uphold that and recognize that. Um, so apart from all the legal explanations, the, the main issue is that it's outdated. I mean, uh, we don't think that it's got any relevance in today's world. And the sooner it's sort of relegated <laughs> to history, the better. Thank, thank you, Smith. Uh, uh, some wise comments for the UK uh, legislators. Uh, Deborah, from the perspective of uh, representing corporate debtors, what issues arise from the enforcement of the rule in Gibbs? Dealing with a company that's in financial distress and, you know, if, if a client walks in and they've got a manufacturing business and they've got plants all over the world, and, I mean, this is the issue between territorialism and universalism. If many other countries would take positions like the ruling Gibbs, Gibbs doesn't just apply to funded debt. It applies to a lease of a manufacturing plan, of a movie theater, of a retail location. It applies to every contract or agreement. I deal with corporate debtors that have thousands of contracts and agreements. And it would be completely unmanageable if multiple jurisdictions applied rules and gibbs, you would have holdout creditors, you would never be able to have a collective proceeding and bind the, um, you, you know, in terms of cramming down on classes. And it would be very, very expensive. And when, when companies come to see us and they're in distress, they usually haven't done it before, hopefully, and they want to know that there's clear, predictable path. And in a global world, that path needs to be predictable across the world. That's why we've all spent so much time in UNCITRAL trying to harmonize the laws. And Gibbs, you know, allowing Gibbs to be out there and putting aside the legal arguments for it from a practical perspective, it's, it's just taking away from all of that work that's being done. And it's really a step back, in my mind, from what we're trying to do with the global economy and with having predictability and efficiency and collective proceedings. That's my short answer. Thank you, Deborah. Robert, uh, do you have any comments on, <clears throat> on the Skibs issue? Yeah, I, I have two short comments. One is, in the Netherlands, we would never have something like a Gibbs rule because we think jurisdiction and applicable law are completely separate topics. Our courts apply foreign law and they find it, and they have no say in it, but I think we find it okay if foreign courts apply our law. Um, hopefully they hire me as an expert in this case. <laughs> The, the second thing I want to say is this is a, a quote from an old German author 
Um, so Alexander, I think, and Frank, they, they will know it. And it reads in English, law and statutes are inherited like an internal disease. They move from one generation to the other and slowly from one place to the other. Uh, that's from Goethe, actually, so I think he was wise. Thank you, Robert. Uh, we'll switch up gears and we'll talk uh, now about the importance of the adoption of the model law on uh, recognition and enforcement of insolvency-related judgments, as well as some of the anticipated challenges. So we'll start off with Min. Um, why don't you tell us about the importance of the adoption and uh, provide some comments about uh, the importance uh, for Korea, as well as some of the anticipated challenges. Uh, thank you. Uh, because of the uh, limited time and space, uh, I, I'd like to focus on the foreign discharge order and the issues remaining from the Supreme Court uh, decision uh, and how that can be resolved. Uh, next slide, please. Yes. Uh, the issues remaining from the uh, Supreme Court decision of 2010, which I explained, uh, first of all, in inbound cases, uh, some traditional rule requirements, uh, for instance, service process reciprocity, uh, need clarification or reasonable adjustment through interpretation or legislation. The Supreme Court opined that the traditional rule uh, would apply to recognition of foreign discharge order. Uh, they did not distinguish whether the traditional rules, the provisions of a civil uh, procedures code directly uh, uh, apply to uh, recognition of foreign uh, discharge order or uh, apply, can be applied by analogy. And direct application would raise some difficulty in meeting the requirements for legitimacy of service of process, which I will uh, deal with later. And in outbound cases, uh, an issue remains whether a Korean debtor who initiated uh, a reorganization proceeding in Korea um, should file or initiate concurrent insolvency proceeding in UK, which did not, which would not recognize the discharge order, which will be affected in Korean reorganization proceeding. Uh, that remains an issue. Um, there are several uh, Korean shipping companies which initiated a reorganization proceeding in Korea and obtained uh, reliefs uh, from states uh, based upon MLCBI in the United States, United Kingdom, Singapore, and uh, Australia, and some, some other countries. And the Korean shipping companies uh, obtained uh, the permanent injunction order based upon Chapter 15 of U.S. Bankruptcy Code with regard to discharge of its debt under the confirmed uh, plan. However, I have never heard uh, of a case where a shipping company filed a concurrent uh, insolvency proceeding in UK or uh, a dispute uh, arises, arose later uh, where the uh, UK uh, creditor attempted to enforce its claims in UK. There is no such instance, but still uh, this issue is a very uh, critical issue. And the, the reason why we need the adoption of MRIJ, for inbound cases, the MRIJ provides uh, predictable and adequate requirements for harmonization and facilitation of cross-border insolvency. For outbound cases, MRIJ reasonably minimizes or reduces the need for concurrent insolvency proceedings. Uh, next, next, next slide, please. Uh, slide 10. Okay, next slide. Um, le let me briefly uh, uh, point out some potential hurdle uh, in adopting uh, the MLIJ or applying the MLIJ. This is service or process for discharge order or confirmation of reorganization plan. A each of discharge order and confirmation of reorganization plan is a crucial part of insolvency proceeding, which are non-adversarial collective proceedings and timely issuance of this judgment is essential to the success of the proceeding. Therefore, uh, legitimacy of service of process, 
uh, relating to Article 14A of MLIJ for such judgment need to be examined from the perspectives of procedural public policy without strict adherence to traditional rules, traditional rules that are applicable to adversarial bilateral actions. Uh, Article 14A provides that the party against whom uh, the judgment was rendered was notified in this state of the institution of that proceeding in a manner that is incompatible with the rules of this state concerning service of documents. So uh, in Korea, and I think it will be the same in uh, civil law countries, the service of process should be made, if made in Korea, should, be, should comply with the Korean law. And under Korean law, uh, we are party to Hague Convention on uh, Service of Process. It requires uh, some lengthy and complicated process, and Korea does not uh, adopt, acknowledge the service of process or notification by mail or email. So therefore, uh, directly uh, applying the traditional rules with cause, with uh, some potential hurdle for enforcement of foreign discharge order, which is not yet directly dealt uh, in Supreme Court case. So uh, in, in, in uh, accepting Article 14A or uh, we, the, by legislation or by interpretation, uh, some flexible approach uh, is required uh, for uh, smooth recognition of foreign discharge order or confirmation of reorganization plan. Thank you. Thank you, Min. Diana, do you have anything further to add on the importance of the adoption of the new model law and some of the potential challenges that you foresee? Yes, thank you, Adam, again. Uh, I have to tell that something. After pandemic, we have a lot of rules, yes. We, we had before three different proceedings. We have right now seven different proceedings. So we have like a patchwork of uh, insolvency system. So we have to reorganize this, this system and I think that a good way to uh, update our system is to enact not only the cross-border insolvency law, it's also this, this law of recognition, because uh, in this way, and also the, the model law of group enterprise, because uh, if we want to be a, like a, a, not a hub of insolvency in, in Latin America, or a place to foreign shopping, but uh, that you can go to Colombia and file your proceeding and receive a, a good or a right treatment for the court, we need to have this kind of uh, tools. I think that was not, maybe the Article X is enough, uh, another people said, but I think that we have to take advantage of the, of, of the work of the Group 5 and, that I said, update our, our law. I, I want to remark that the Mevorek pre teacher professor said that is the better way is maybe uh, harmonization and integration of the rules. It's not only, as a Rodrigo say, an exercise of copy-paste. I think that we can um, adopt our, for our system, that our system is uh, civil law. So that is, that is the, the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. We've heard a fair bit on the adoption of Article X, so we apologize for any overlap. Uh, Howard, I'll move to you. Uh, can you explain why it's the UK's expressed intention to implement Article X? <clears throat> well, the cynic would say to save Gibbs, but it's not just to save Gibbs. It's to, um, for reasons that were, were, were very well expressed on the original panel, it does the least, uh, makes the least change to the existing law and yet has the important effect of putting it in a position where we overcome the challenge posed by Rubin that the courts will be able to recognize judgments. And remember that even if um, even if one of the factors that are, are, are listed as reasons why a foreign judgment shouldn't be recognized, and there would be the Gibbs protection there, as one might call it, nonetheless, foreign judgment, overcoming the problem you were talking about, Smith, where with the case of the guarantees, 
um, it could be recognised by, by, by an English court. And what we're seeing is, um, is if one steps back and looks at the achievements of the ANSI trial model law and the nations that who have been involved in its drafting and its adoption, those who are seriously considering its adoption, everyone's on that ghastly word, a journey, but it's a journey which at the outset of my career was unthinkable, that we would come together as uh, an international committee of nations to such a degree that we're sitting trying to further progress uh, and get over the remaining bumps in the road. Each time we recognize a foreign proceeding, a foreign judgment, it is a ceding of the absolute authority of one's nation's courts. And uh, the degree of international cooperation that's been achieved, albeit slowly, and slower than many would like is remarkable. So sometimes I think it's, it's wonderful to, to look down and see how far one has ascended before realizing that the uh, final climb to the summit is going to be very challenging. I've got no doubt that over time, uh, seriously, Gibbs uh, will be overcome, the problem that's presented by Gibbs. Um, but Article X slots very neatly into the existing corpus of law that we have on this topic, and I think that it will be welcomed by the profession, by the judiciary, and sensibly applied, and that we'll see further steps forward, which together with the work being done by the Insolvency Service and His Majesty's Government's lawyers will see us in a position, and I'm perhaps sticking my neck out, anticipating what the results of the consultation will be, that there will be further consultation in relation to Gibbs and further movements towards uh, a level of international cooperation which will satisfy everybody. Thank you, Howard. Uh, Min, I'll go back to you quickly. What are your views on whether Article X should be adopted and how it should be adopted? I think if, uh, previous slide, please. Slide nine. Yes, uh, there are three uh, possible options uh, which may be considered by the uh, enacting state. Uh, let me first try the la with the last one, adopting only Article X, which is already uh, covered by uh, Professor Eric Melvrach in the first uh, session. I, I will just read uh, what I wrote in the slide. Uh, this option may be considered by states that have adopted MLCBI and it's necessary to consider a discretionary nature of the additional relief and whether to include uh, limited grounds for refusal in the MLCBI, similar to those provided the MLIJ. And also it's necessary to consider how to deal with the period following the closure of foreign insolvency proceeding and allowing for petition by a creditor or any other interested person. But anyway, um, I think UK appears to consider this option and uh, after UK announces uh, how uh, to accommodate, incorporate uh, this Article X into the existing uh, MLCBI, uh, the other states will uh, be very uh, the considered carefully. And uh, in Korea, uh, the first option may be uh, it's more likely uh, adopt only main provision excluding Article X just because uh, this approach would be closer to the traditional rules and the Supreme Court precedent of 2010. And however, we need to consider choosing between extension model and assimilation model under Article 15 of the MLIJ. Another option, the last option may be adopting entire MLIJ, including Article X. And in this case, in order to avoid or otherwise address overlap, um, it is necessary to, to define the relationship between the main provisions and Article X. Uh, personally, I think uh, one way may be uh, uh, the discharge order or confirmation of re uh, reorganization plan, which is part of core part of the insolvency proceeding, uh, may be uh, covered by Article X. And the other adversarial and bilateral insolvency related judgment may be covered by the other main provisions of MLIJ. That may be uh, one option I, in my personal view. Uh, thank you.
Thank you, Min. Uh, Smith, uh, what uh, downsides or limitations do you see if a state adopts uh, only Article X and not the whole MLIJ? I think Howard and, and the first panel answered this. I mean, the, it's just that it's discretionary. It gives the court the discretion as opposed to mandatorily enforcing, recognizing and enforcing judgments. And I take the point that maybe the UK will not use it to retain Gibbs, but the UK is not the only country that has, um, has the Gibbs rule. I mean, it's kind of tainted a few other jurisdictions, right? And those jurisdictions, by virtue of their political situation, may have very different policy views moving forward and, and you know, this historical, this will become something that you've been inherited and it just bogs you down. So thanks, thanks for that from the UK. <laughs> as, as Robert said, the disease that's been inherited. Uh, Deborah, are there any efforts underway in the US to adopt the model law, the new model law? Yeah, unfortunately, no. Um, <laughs> And uh, it's my personal view and not the view of uh, my law firm or, uh, or III or anything else. I think, uh, unfortunately, our, the political situation in the U.S. is right now very little is being done in our Congress. Um, but there is not a push right now. I think within the insolvency community, I think you heard Judge Gropper and others' views that it would be a beneficial ad, whether it's just Article X or the entire model law or some combination. Um, Again, from where we started at the very beginning, it's not really an issue in the U.S. It's not perceived to be an issue because we do recognize and enforce foreign judgments under various different um, schemes, but, um, but there, there is not an effort. I think it would take an industry group to get behind this and, and the other model law on groups um, to really push it. And right now, we're not seeing it on anybody's agenda, unfortunately. Thank you, Deborah. Robert, what are the strong points of the new model law and the MLCBI uh, that warrant adoption from a Dutch perspective? <clears throat> yeah, if you allow me, I will mainly focus on what the, the strong points on the present um, model law, because we have a very short horizon in the Netherlands, and it would be already quite an achievement if we would adopt it. Um, and I would like to give you an example from the Yukos case, which we had in the Netherlands. Uh, I'll just give a very brief description. It was a Russian parent. Um, it had a subsidiary in the Netherlands, and all the European activities were under that subsidiary. The Russian parent, Yukos Oil, went bankrupt. And um, the trustee did two things with respect to the Dutch subsidiary. Uh, he replaced the management, and he sold the shares. Now, the question was whether uh, these decisions could be recognized and whether the Russian bankruptcy could be recognized. And we don't have a system of um, a kind of preliminary proceedings in which it is established whether um, recognition or relief uh, should be given. Under the automatic system, as as we now see it from our Supreme Court, it actually means that, for, record, that to ha for a foreign proceeding to have effects in the Netherlands, nothing has to be done. Those effects are, um, the, rec the recognition part is automatic. And that meant that um, proceedings started on whether, for example, the sale of these shares was valid that that had to be looked at retroactively, and the proceedings took 12 years altogether, went up and down to the Supreme Court twice. Um, so the legal situation was in limbo for 12 years. Now, that by itself is unfortunate, and you also have to realize that <coughs> the, 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 the stakeholders of UCOS who continued actually the proceedings against the Russian state, they had sufficient money to conduct those proceedings for 12 years. But if you are a poor, um, a small company or a, 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 a poor individual from some country where um, bankruptcy proceedings are used as a, as a means of disappropriation, Having proceedings for 12 years in the Dutch court is, of course, impossible. 
So that's one of the reasons why I think that the system under the uncertain model law is um, so much to be preferred above what we have because you get decisions at the start and moreover the, our Supreme Court now introduced the, t the public policy test here but a test which si in which the court is to decide whether a measure that is being asked is really in the interest of the stakeholders, the creditors and the debtor I think is a much more appropriate way of approaching it. That being said, I think that if, if the Netherlands would uh, introduce the uh, uncertain model law, they would, they would take along the related judgments as well. But I don't think that will be much of an issue for us. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, we have just one more uh, question I have for Min, and Min's promised that he will take only one minute. Uh, so Min, <laughs> what uh, other important practical issues do you foresee in adopting the uh, MLIJ? Okay, uh, next slide, please. Yes, the second half of this slide, the states that have adopted the MLCBI need to reconcile with MLIJ. I picked up just two uh, issues. It is necessary to determine whether recognition of foreign insolvency proceeding under the MLCBI is necessary for foreign insolvency representative to obtain standing in the MLIJ-related lawsuit. Uh, in the MLIJ itself, it does not require uh, recognition of the underlying insolvency proceeding before recognition or enforcement of foreign insolvency-related judgment. But when we apply MLCBI together, then this, this issue should be resolved. For instance, uh, a lawsuit in which the issue of recognition is raised as a defense, this issue may arise. And also it's necessary to decide how the supervision and control over a foreign insolvency representative under MLCBI would apply to uh, the MLIJ context. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Min. Uh, that concludes our discussion. Uh, are there any questions for the panelists? All right, well, you will have time uh, to ask any questions in person because we now have a 10-minute break uh, for coffee and to stretch your legs. Uh, I want to thank the panelists for their hard work in preparing for this panel.